good. Um, okay, so recording. Accountability. So let's proceed with accountability. So last week we talked about relations. Uh, so a relation is basically uh, any subset of the Cartesian product of two sets. Uh, or it could be more sets, but we took binary relations, which are two sets. Um, and we took how to, uh, the composition of relations, so how to, you, you know, uh, say relation R follows from relation S. And uh, it's simply, you know, you follow the arrows from one, one uh, relation to the next. Uh, we talked about reflexive, symmetric, anti-symmetric, and transitive relations. And we talked about how to do closures. Uh, not anti-symmetric closures, but closures on ref, uh, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive closures in order to sort of uh, make relations have those properties. Um, and then we looked at types of relations which are based on those properties. So if you have a reflexive, symmetric, and transitive relation, then you have an equivalence class. And if you have a reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive relation, then you have a partial order. And we've seen uh, uh, some examples of those as well. So this week, uh, we're going to talk about countability. So we're going to jump backwards a little bit. Um, it's a little bit out of order because, uh, as I mentioned before, well, typically we don't get to this. And I think when Robert organized the, so he, Robert organized basically how this, the order this material is presented in. Um, and so he skips countability because we don't often get to it. Uh, but we did this time, so that's great. Um, so it is uh, going back to uh, sets and functions on sets. And uh, so in, in a sense, countability is the foundation of discrete math. We'll talk about why that is. Um, and we'll talk about countable and uncountable uh, infinite sets. So any finite set is countable, but some infinite sets are not countable. And we'll talk about what that is. Um, and then we'll move on to introduction to algorithms. So these are uh, so when you're writing computer programs, these are different strategies you can use to, um, to help you solve difficult problems. Um, so we're going to talk, we're going to look at three of them that are, uh, the most popular, arguably. So we'll look at, uh, greedy strategies. Uh, we'll look at dividing count conquer strategies and we'll look at hill climbing. And then, uh, in the, I'm not sure exactly how long that's going to take. I've modified the slides a lot. So it's, it's difficult to tell, but um, if we get through all that, then I'm going to jump into some proofs here. This is, I'm gonna prove these things sort of using um, a style of proof, that, not that we use in this class, but uh, moving forward into 2804 and 3804, these are the types of proofs that you'll see. Um, and so just to, just in case, all of the countability and introduction to algorithms uh, is over really quickly. We'll do this. This is this will be sort of optional, but it's a it's a tie-in to what you'll see uh, in later years to later classes. So when you write proofs in 2804 and 3804, you, you won't really use the the methods that we showed you here. Um, the methods that we showed you here are very explicit. Uh, you know, you may have noticed, you, you probably had the inkling at some point that, hey, I can write a sentence that'll describe this proof instead of writing all these steps. And you're correct. And that's generally how we do it uh, in math. But um, it really helps to learn the foundations and, uh, you know, the logical equivalences and all that from scratch uh, in order to properly construct proofs as you move forward. So... Um, and I like graph theory, so that's basically why I chose to do uh, to do these proofs. And they're pretty, I think they're pretty neat. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, countability. So the set of positive, positive integers is this Z plus uh, figure. And so it's equal to one, two, three, um, all the way up to basically uh, infinity. So there should be an infinity here. Um, so a set is considered countable if it is finite. So any finite set, uh, so if I have A equals one, two, three, that is definitely a countable set. Um, or if it has the same cardinality as uh, the 
positive integers. Now the same the cardinality of positive integers is of course infinite. So how can we count something that's infinite? I guess that's the uh, that's the question. Um, yeah. So how can a set A have the same cardinality as the set of positive integers? Well, if we know anything about if we recall back to our functions, if there is a bijection between A and, uh, and a set of positive integers, then they must have the same cardinality. Cardinality is, of course, the number of items in each set. Um, and this is sort of functionally equivalent to uh, if we could take the elements of A and list them in some order. Um, and by some order, we mean something that uh, includes every element. So as long as there's some really well-defined order, and in a sense, that order is uh, like a generating function, something um, that includes every element, then we can think of it as a countable set. Um, otherwise, we say the set A is uncountable. All right, so for example, um, we could look at the set of positive integers and we can look at the set of positive odd integers and uh, ask what is the cardinality of each of these sets? So is there a bijection from the set of positive integers to the set of odd integers? This O here is not officially the odd integer. Uh, this is just something I, I, I made up. Um, but is there a bijection between those two? Now it seems like if I if I look at z, if I look at the positive integers and I count one, two, three, four, and it just seems like I've removed all the even elements here. So you might think that uh, the set of odd integers has a has less items than the set of integer positive integers. Um, but in order to establish it. Um, Either way, either prove it or disprove it, we have to uh, prove or disprove that there's a bijection. So if there is a bijection, obviously they have the same cardinality, and if not, then they don't. <clears throat> All right, so so for a bijection, we need to have, it must be injective. and surjective. So let's define um, a function for the set of odd integers it could be f of x equals 2x minus 1. So this function is sort of a generating, generating function that generates all the, uh, all the odd integers. So is it injective? And what does injective mean again? Does anybody remember what injective means? So injective means it's one-to-one, -one, which means that yeah, somebody. Yeah, one to one. Every image has at most one pre-image. Exactly. So it's one to one, and every image has at most one pre-image. Um, and so to show that is, we'll sort of informally uh, go through this proof because it is actually one that we've seen before. So if we take these two um, images and make them equivalent or equal. Um, then I get 2n minus 1 equals 2m minus 1. Um, I can add 1 to both sides and then uh, divide both sides by 2. So if, if I have the same uh, image, then I have the same pre-image as, uh, as we've shown here. Um, but without all the, uh, all the um, you know, I didn't label each step. Um, we just sort of went through it uh, informally. Um, subjective or surjective. So what's, uh, what's the definition of surjective? Yeah, 
it's on to. And it's also, um, let's see if somebody else got it. Yes, every image has a, um, at least one pre-image. So injective is at most one pre-image, surjective is at least one pre-image. So if you have both inject, uh, injective and surjective, then you have exactly one pre-image, which is what we want. So um, if we define the set T as the set of uh, odd integers, then we can express, uh, or let's say T is an element, then we can express uh, T as 2K minus one, which is equal to the function F of K. Um, so therefore, for any of our odd integers, um, we have a, we have a value K that is the pre-image. So we have at least one pre-image, which means that um, we have a bijection. Uh, so this function here uh, demonstrates a bijection between the positive integers and the positive odd integers. Okay, good. Any questions? Yeah, so what that means is that uh, there's an equal number of uh, integers and or positive integers and positive odd integers, which is sort of uh, not really intuitive, but it means they're countable. And so these sets have the same cardinality. Um, yeah, so that means this is a countable set. So countable is not really about how many items. Countability implies whether the set is discrete or not. So whether the set is composed of discrete items. Um, so what do we mean by that? Well, we've been doing discrete math, so um, everything we've seen has been really a discrete item. So what does it mean to not be a discrete item, I guess, might be a better question. Um, so what, if you think of, say, um, if I have a point in the plane, if I'm on a grid, then it's going to be, the point in the plane is going to be on one of these grid lines. Or if I define it that way, then if my points have to be on the grid lines, then they have discrete positions that they can take on. But if I, for instance, have a plane and put a point somewhere in the plane, then I can always, uh, if I have two points, I can always find a point in between them. And that's, what that means is that that represents some uh, non-discrete realm. It's a continuous realm. Um, so I don't, I won't find discrete numbers there. Hopefully that sort of makes sense. So what about the set of integers? Is there a bijection from uh, Z plus to Z? So do those sets have the same cardinality? Anybody want to guess? So in a sense, what, what we want is a mapping, right? A one-to-one -one mapping. So we can kind of informally, uh, we can informally establish a countable set by say, well, here's my set of positive odd integers or set of positive integers. And now I want to map them to the set of positive and negative integers. Um, so I can map one to one, and then I can map two to perhaps negative one. And then I can map three to it's only injective. Uh, so you sort of think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's deceptive. So countable is something really weird. Yeah, it's infinite. So cardinality means sort of something else. And really what it means is that these are discrete numbers. And what we mean by discrete is that if I give you any two, um, those two can be side by side and no, with no elements in between them. Whereas if I can always find an element in between them, then they're 
then they're not countable, they're not discrete. And really it's not something, so those are continuous numbers, they're also known as real numbers, and there's something that we sort of approximate using computers, but we can never really, uh, you know, you can never represent an irrational number completely uh, because it goes on forever. But if you could find a mapping like this, you can sort of uh, unofficially, would it be a function? Yeah, you can have functions on, on you can have continuous functions, yes. So uh, continuous input and continuous output. <laughs> really weird. It's, it's really the, this is sort of the foundation of discrete math. Um, this is what it means to be discrete, is a, a countable set. Um, so it is kind of weird. It's, it's a little bit counterintuitive because it seems like the set of integers should be twice as big as the set of positive integers. But what does twice as big mean when you're talking about infinity? Well, um, it means something a little bit different than what you would expect. So to have the same cardinality, we need basically a mapping. So I can map 3 to 2 and 4 to negative 2 and 5 to 3 and 6 to negative 3 if 6 was here. Yeah, you can do that all the way up to infinity. Um, in a sense, it's, you can think of a countable set as, a, so let's say you're streaming Netflix. Um, so how much data are you going to stream? Well, uh, what if you streamed Netflix forever? Um, you know, you, you, that's not possible, but let's say you're doing that. How much data are you going to consume? Well, it's going to be an infinite amount, but it's still a countable amount because it is still discrete data. Um, so that's sort of, we, we do, and we do in computer science deal a lot with the count, concept of infinite streams. Uh, which are really just streams where we don't know when the end is. We don't know how big they are. So we have to kind of assume that they go on forever. Yeah, exactly. So it can be infinite and still countable. Although that's, you know, now you're getting into some philosophical territory. I, I, but, uh, you know, if it's countable, could it ever really be infinite? But in math, we, we define it to be infinite. Um, but countable is, is different from uncountable. Um, so you can have infinite countable sets, which is really, yeah, it's like opening a stream to Netflix and then binging uh, for eternity. Uh, the difference between integers and floating numbers, no decimals. Uh, I am sort of hinting at that, not, not just floats, or, or floats are sort of, they're still finite. Uh, we're going to get into the difference between integers and real numbers. Um, decimals would be countable if you restricted yourself to a number of decimal points. Yes, that's correct. And in computers, so if you limit the sort of the word length of your floats or your doubles, um, although there are in, uh, I believe in Python, you can represent a number as, as big as your memory if you wanted to, um, but it's still going to be uh, finite, right? So you can have um, some finite set of precision. And what we're really, you know, we're really trying to approximate the, approximate the real numbers, which are infinite, but um, you can't do that on a computer because it has finite memory. And even, you know, all the computers on Earth, uh, all put together, have finite memory. But, but that's not to say you can still create content as you're going, so you can have these infinite streams, um, but they're still countable. Um, so they're still discrete data, but it goes on for technically forever. So yeah, that's really, yeah, that's sort of getting maybe a little more on the philosophical side of things, but uh, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting. And, uh, and it really, this is, sort of the foundation of this entire class. So, um, you know, taking it on the last day is sort of, I guess, uh, appropriate. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, you can informally make a count countable set or informally identify a countable set uh, by making sort of this correspondence. Um, and this would go on, of course, for infinity. So if you can uh, make so, uh, a one-to-one -one correspondence between the integers and whatever set you're trying to count, uh, then it is a countable set. 
Um, we're going to see examples of countable sets and, and non-countable sets. So yeah. So this is, um, I could more formally go through this. I can if you want. Um, actually, let's, let's, let's do this. So we'll define uh, this function here, f. So this f of i is um, the ceiling of i over 2 if i is odd. And negative i over 2 if i is even. So that's this function. And we can see that it's a function because um, for every i, we have it's mapped onto some image. So that's um, so that's fine. And there's no two uh, no two pre or uh, no two pre images that map to no two images that map back to the same pre image. So yes, that's right. So every, every um, pre-image has its unique image. Um, and then we can quickly, so what's the other, what's the other way to identify a bijection? Does anybody, so we can, we can prove that it's injective and surjective, but there's another way we can do that. If it's invertible, yeah. So if we can define this, invert this function and let's call this, on J, and we can say that it's the absolute value of 2J if J is less than zero, and 2J minus one if J is greater than zero. All right, and this is a function um, also because uh, each pre-image maps to exactly one image, right? So for a given J, I get, uh, exactly one um, image that I map to. So this, so the inversion of this is, uh, is also a function. So this uh, is a bijection. Okay, so that's another way to identify uh, countable sets. So are there sets larger than the positive integers? So we'll look at two more examples. So we're gonna look at the positive rational numbers and then we're gonna look at the real numbers. And of course, I think, I believe I've given away the game. So uh, are there sets larger than the positive integers? Yes, uh, so there's, I talked about the real numbers. And so we're gonna look at them. Um, but first we're gonna look at the rational numbers. So a rational number is any number that can be written as a fraction using uh, two integers, P and Q. Uh, positive rational numbers can be written as uh, P over Q, where P and Q are both positive. Um, and that's and one, I guess, sort of byproduct of, of being able to write a rational number that way is that uh, uh, the number of decimal places is finite. Uh, but that's, uh, so we'll see why that matters in, in a little bit. So let's try and list the positive rational numbers in some countable order. So I said before, you can informally sort of list them. And if you can list them in such a way that it forms this bijective function, then it's, uh, then it's a countable set. <clears throat> um, but any order will need to include every possible rational number. So here's two candidates. So uh, one over one, one over two, one over three, one over four, on to uh, one over infinity. And then uh, one over one, two over one, three over one, four over one, up to infinity over one. Um, so you might see a problem with these because um, if we count in this order, um, we don't. It does not result in progress because we never count a number larger than one, right? So this is the biggest number we ever count, um, even though there's an infinite number of these numbers. Um, we're not actually counting uh, this set of rational numbers. If we count in this number, uh, we never count a number that's less than one. So we never count any fractions. Um, so even though there's an infinite number of these, we don't count every number in this set of rationals. 
So how could we count every number in a set of rationals? Does anybody have any ideas? Before I go on with this. Piecewise function. I'm not sure what that, I'm not sure what that means. Um, so let's maybe list out count them upside down kind of. Yeah, well, I think, so we're gonna list them in sort of a, there's infinite of one over X. Uh, you might be on the right track. Yeah, exactly. So if we list them, yeah, an infinite number of one over X and an infinite number of two over X, uh, and an infinite number of three over X. So going this way, we get this, um, you know, over X, we're increasing in the denominator. And if we go this way, we're increasing in the numerator. And so we can list out, uh, so we have this sort of a, a table, but the table is infinite. So it stretches out infinitely far to the right and infinitely far uh, down, so to speak. Um, so now how do, what's a good way to count these that we would always, we would be sure to count all of them. We'd always make some sort of progress um, and we'd never miss any. Does anybody have any, any ideas of which order should I count these in? Because if I just strictly stay on the top row, then I'll never finish, right? It'll go to an uh, infinity. So I will never re reach the second row. And if I start counting downwards, well, I'll also keep counting to infinity. So I'll never reach the uh, second column. So, yeah, it's an infinite table. And some of these are duplicates, right? So some of these can be reduced. Three over three, four over four, two over two. These are all equal to one over one. So we're counting some of them twice, which is, or, you know, we're counting some of them an infinite amount, which is actually not a problem, as we'll see. So one way that we can think of it is equivalence classes. So a set is countable if we can divide it into finite sized equivalence classes and the equivalence classes are countable. Um, right, so we have this sort of composition of, of countable sets. So we want equivalence classes that uh, that will um, uh, count every number in, in this set and that themselves are countable. So let's think of, uh, let's look at the diagonals, right? So um, each one of these is, is made up of a finite number, so they're countable. You know, um, eventually you get to infinity, but it's sort of, um, if I give you any, I can number these from one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera. So technically it is infinite, but I never actually get to infinity. Um, and another way to think of it is uh, when we talked about, um, you can make this one-to-one -one correspondence and in order to make this one-to-one -one correspondence to the set of positive integers, uh, you can just make a path that makes uh, progress. So if I counted them in this order, uh, that's defined by this path, then I don't end up skipping anybody. Um, and eventually I count, you know, if I give you any finite limit, I can count up to there, no problem. And uh, all the way to infinity, so to speak. But yeah, this is a little, this is where it gets a little bit weird. So how can we describe each diagonal? So, um, in the first diagonal, we take the numerator and the denominator and add them, add them together in the lowest, well, it doesn't even have to be the lowest form, um, and we get two. Uh, and in the second diagonal, we add the numerator and the denominator and we get three. The third diagonal, we add and we get four. In the fourth diagonal, um, each of these sums up to five. All right, so we have, this exhaustive list that goes through and counts and puts each of these rational numbers into uh, an equivalence class. And each of those equivalence classes is finite because for any finite number here, 
uh, the number of ways I can add P and Q is also finite. <laughs> so then, yeah, there's a finite number of rational numbers and uh, K is a subset. So I go from two to three to four to five up to infinity. So it's a subset of the positive integers, which is also countable. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions or comments? Observations. Okay. So yeah, we have counted some entries multiple times. So is that a contradiction to there being a bijection? Uh, not really, because we can just take away the duplicate entries and then shift everything down one. So things are still countable, uh, even though we've double counted some things. Uh, so that does not contradict the fact that there's a bijection. We've just shown that there exists a bijection. We've not explicitly defined a function um, in a sense. So what is the, all right, good. Why isn't this a function? So we've, if we go back to here, this, this list here, if I, if I sort of sound them off in this order, that's not a function, right? Um, and each of these, so this is, you know, f of one, f of two, f of three. But why is it not a function? Oh, wait, maybe it is a function. Sorry, I forget I said anything. Yeah, I'm confusing myself now. All right, so let's talk about the cardinality of the real numbers now. So what are the real numbers? Um, so we're gonna try something easier to start with. So the set of real numbers between zero and one, excluding zero and one is a countable set. So the set of real numbers is every number between zero and one, uh, and up to an infinite number of decimal places. So each of the real numbers is a number that can be written um, like this. So each of these D1 is a digit, D2 is a digit, D3 is a digit, et cetera, et cetera. Each digit is a number between zero and nine. Um, and so we count them from one to infinity. So these are the set of, uh, numbers between zero and one with an infinite number of, uh, of decimal places, although it also includes the, uh, the finite numbers. So if this set is countable, we can list them in some exhaustive order. So what we're going to do is the same thing we try to do for the rational numbers is we're going to try and list them in some exhaustive order. So what we're going to do is just assume that this order exists. So here it is. Uh, or the first number is zero point D and this, this digit, which is a number between zero and nine, this digit D one, two, D one, three, D one, four. So D one, four is the uh, fourth digit of the first number that we're, that we're uh, counting. <clears throat> so this is a list of arbitrary elements and we either show a bijection with, uh, with a set of positive in integers or we describe a number that's not on this list in order to prove it's either countable or uncountable. And so if we, if we find a number that's not on the list, then uh, we can prove that the set is not countable by contradiction. So we're assuming this order exists and we are either going to confirm it or we're going to find a contradiction. So if there is a bijection, uh, then the real numbers have the same cardinality as the positive integers. Um, <laughs> so I didn't, uh, I guess I didn't quite get to this slide in terms of uh, setting it up for the, for the reveal. So let's just walk through it. Um, are we expecting the set of real numbers to be larger, smaller, or the same size as positive integers? Well, we would expect it to be smaller if 
Um, so we're including all the, because uh, the, the real numbers includes all the rational numbers, but it also includes all the numbers with uh, an infinite number of decimal places. So the irrational numbers. So we, in a sense, since we've already shown that the rational numbers um, have the same cardinality as the set of positive integers, um, we would expect that uh, this function here, uh, that the set of reals is, or the set of positive reals is going to be larger. Uh, and if it's larger, that means it's not surjective, which means we can find an element of the positive reals that uh, is not mapped to. Yeah. So to find a real number that isn't on our list. But our list is arbitrary numbers, so so the, how we find it is a little bit tricky. So we have this arbitrary list. How are we going to define a number that's not on the list? Um, so let's assume that we have a number. So we're going to take this number. So this digit is 1 if uh, the ith digit of the ith number is not equal to 1 or it's two if the ith digit of the ith number is equal to one. So I have all these numbers here and then I'm just going to basically, um, every time I, I'm gonna take the diagonal and every time I see a number here, if this number is the same, I'm just going to change it to something different. And why can I do that? Well, because I have an infinite number of digits to work with. So if I could define it like this, this number definitely exists. Um, and so one example might be this, it's made up of the numbers one and two, the digits one and two, um, but for any number on our exhaustive list, at least one digit does not match. All right, so this is, this is where it gets a little bit weird. Um, and the reason, uh, you're confused by what you think is a numbered list. So which, uh, which slide number? Ah, so this is our list here. So um, and these are the numbers and these are digits. So if, you know, I could think of some examples. So 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera. Um, and then repeating. And then the second number is 0 0.2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera. Repeating forever. Uh, once I reach 9, I just start at 0 again. Yeah, so it's just a numbered list, and these these digits are are numbers. We're not sure what they are. We're trying to represent them with an arbitrary variable. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's it. Is a little bit with all the abstract uh, uh, abstract variables. It does get a little confusing because there's a lot of a lot of subscript numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, I agree. The first time I read this this proof, I also had to read it a few times before um, it really sunk in what was going on. Because it is, yeah, we have a bunch of representing arbitrary numbers, but we're doing it using, you know, the subscript one one, which is a little bit confusing. Okay, any other questions on that? So we have this number here, um, and it's not going to match. So for for instance, uh, digit D11 is one here, so it would be our number that doesn't match is going to be 0.2, and then uh, this one is a three, so we can have a one, and then it would likely be uh, 111, and then two every ninth number um, if we ordered them like this. So we can always find a number basically that's not on our list. That's the that's the takeaway from this. Um, and yeah, the, the abstraction gets a little bit uh, uh, hard on the eyes and hard to parse. All right. So uh, this number will not be equal to uh, this number because E1 is not equal to D11. It will not equal the second number here 
because E2 is not equal to D22, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of the proof that the, and this number does exist. Uh, it's a real number, which means it can have an infinite number of, uh, of digits. It's irrational, but um, it is not on our list. So the real numbers cannot be counted. Okay. So does that make sense? Is there any questions? So why doesn't this argument work with the rationals? So the rationals you recall are the, and we can write it as a, a fraction basically using two integers. Yeah. So the reason basically, and it's not that easy to, so now we're really in an abstract territory, but um, any rational has a, a finite number of, of decimals, right? Um, so I can't find, even though technically they go to infinity, um, they're always a countable number of decimals. So I guess in a sense, the irrationals have an uncountable number of decimals, maybe. Uh, actually, you should not take my word for that. Um, but it's because basically when you go to infinity, you can always uh, find some way to uh, to flip one digit somewhere that that makes it uh, makes it a whole new number that hasn't been counted. <clears throat> All right. And this is so. What types of sets do we use in computer science? What types of sets do we use in discrete math? So I already went over this um, a few times. So these are all countable sets. Because as I said, this is the foundation of discrete math. Um, and uncountable sets can be thought of as continuous. And when we say continuous, we mean that choose any two values a and b with a less than b, and there is always a value x in between them. So that's um, that's continuous if we're talking about so those are continuous functions. And if we're talking about uh, numbers, those are irrational numbers. Uh, so they have an infinite number of, uh, of decimal places, so to speak. All right. <clears throat> uh, what about the Cartesian product of two, two countable sets? So recall the Cartesian product is uh, uh, I take uh, an item from the one set, and then I match it to every item in the other set. Uh, so the Cartesian product of one, two, and three, four is one, three, one, four, two, three, two, four. So what do we think? Is that countable or uncountable? So it is, let's think of it as, well, I can list out, even though these two sets are infinite, I can take the Cartesian product and I can list them out uh, in this order. And then I can sort of build a table the same way I built a table uh, for the rational numbers. So basically, um, and each of these is in some equivalence class where both of the digits add up to the same number, right? So I can count them the same way I counted the, the, uh, the rational numbers. So the Cartesian product of two countable sets, any two countable sets is also countable. What about the power set? So if we recall the power set of a set is the set of all possible subsets. So if A is set one, two, three, then the power set is the empty set. One, two, three, uh, one, two, one, three, two, three, and one, two, three. Uh, so what do we think? Is that set countable? So, yeah, I mean, this is a tricky one. And it turns out it's not really intuitive at all. 
uh, whether it's countable or not. So it's not really a fair question to ask, I suppose. Um, the answer is no. Because it turns out that for any set A, uh, the cardinality of that set is strictly less than the, than the power set, even for infinite sets. Uh, and that implies there cannot be a bijection. So uh, the power set of an infinite set is not countable. Um, and so there is a little bit of a proof. This is, uh, uh, we'll go through it. So we'll prove that, so we'll take a countable set A, and prove that F, some function that maps A to its power set, uh, cannot be a surjection. So some element of the power set is not mapped to. And so how we're going to do that is we're going to define some set B, uh, which is a subset of A. So that means, that also means that uh, B is an element of the power set of A. And the set is defined such that uh, it's all the elements that don't map to a subset uh, that they're in, right? So if I had say, um, one, two, three, and I had the power set. So I have the empty set and I have one, two. So if I mapped one to the empty set, for instance, then uh, one would be a member of B because one is mapped to a set that doesn't contain itself. Okay. So then, uh, the proof goes, and this is a little bit tricky, but uh, let Y be um, something that maps to the set B. So we said that B is a member of the power set. So Y is some element that maps to this, this, this set here. Um, An infinite number of finite, that's actually a, infinite number of finite things is countable. An infinite number of infinite things is uncountable. Um, I'm not sure, I'd have to get back to you on that. That's, uh, because an infinite number of infinite things could be the, uh, the Cartesian product, right? Um, so it's the way it's phrased, maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't know. This is so this is getting a little, uh, yeah. Infinite number of infinite or non discrete things. Yeah, so even though these are discrete sets, when we do the power set, something uh, something strange happens that I'm not sure. Because technically these are still discrete items, but, but pure math gets a little bit weird, I guess. But uh, all right, I'll finish this proof and then uh, we'll take a break and think about it. And then uh, maybe I can answer that question a little bit better. But uh, Yeah, it's it's not really the way it's phrased initially is not a rule. I would have to uh, read the rest of it to see if that uh, if that makes sense or not. But even this this power set thing, I don't really fully grasp all the implications. All I know is uh, I know the proof of it, um, but the intuition is is beyond me. I don't I don't really have a good grasp of that. Um, Okay, but if we have this element uh, y that uh, maps to b, 
uh, the set B then uh, then if Y is in B, then uh, it cannot map to that set because that's the definition of that set. Um, however, we assume that it did map to that set um, by, uh, so that we, we've come across a contradiction basically, right? If Y is, then if Y is not in B, then Y would actually be in B uh, by definition of B. Okay, so we end up with this contradictory thing where we try and map. Uh, if we map the item to that, to that set, then it cannot be in that set. Um, but if it's not in that set, then it must be in that set. So we end up with this contradiction. Okay, <clears throat> 636. All right, so we'll take our break here um, because this is the end of the uh, countability. And then uh, after the break, we'll get into algorithms, uh, introduction to algorithms, and then possibly, although it appears we won't get to Euler's formula or any of that stuff, but we'll see. Um, and I'll try and maybe think a little more philosophically about this uh, Cantor's theorem and, and uh, try and answer these questions for you. Um, so I have a time of 6.36, let's say, um, we'll come back at 6.47.
All right. Uh, so we're back. Um, I've thought about um, why the power set is uncountable, and I am really, I guess, no closer to an answer. Although it's it's a it's a very very interesting problem. Um, and something I might think a little more about um, because technically it's uh, so the definition of uncountable is I give you two sets. I give you some order and I give you two sets and I can always find uh, now a set that falls in between them um, always, uh, which is sort of in an interesting, uh, an interesting thing. Anyway, yeah, it's a very, it's a very good question. Uh, I like it, uh, but I don't know the answer to it. Um, okay, so before we get started, any questions on, uh, on what we went over before? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So now we're going to talk about introduction to algorithms. And um, it's again, these are slides designed by Dr. Robert Collier, and I've made some modifications to them and added, of course, some errors. Um, <clears throat> so algorithms. Well, we've talked about algorithms before. We've analyzed them. Um, so we take some significant uh, uh, event that takes uh, some bottleneck in time, such as a memory access, and then we count them. And so we've done all that before, but now we want to talk about strategies for, for algorithms uh, that, that have worked sort of well in the past. So just as a refresher, an algorithm is a sequence of steps that's designed to accomplish a specific task. And uh, so we want to sort of differentiate uh, algorithm from um, any programming language. So an algorithm is, is more of a mathematical idea. Um, a representation of an algorithm can be executed on a computer by a, you know, uh, by an implementation. Um, but that's the algorithm itself is sort of this abstract idea. Um, so creating these representations. So coming up with an algorithm and then actually programming it into a computer is known as computer programming. And then there's uh, so there's a lot of, so the algorithms themselves, um, the asymptotic analysis, uh, those are gonna be sort of the heart of your program, but there's a lot of fine tuning that goes along with uh, with programming itself too that, that you don't have to do when you're dealing just with mathematical extra abstraction, so. Um, so when we talk about algorithms, we, we wanna stay away from any specific programming language because that's not what we're talking about. Uh, they should be written at a higher level as a series of steps uh, to manipulate discrete data using, you know, we could describe an algorithm using natural language, uh, pseudocode, or whatever. You could even do it in Java or or something, but um, that's not really ideal because it's, although it can be useful. So the algorithm should inform the choice of programming language, ideally, but actually your job, your boss, legacy code, whatever is going to inform the choice of your programming language, um, unless you're starting from scratch. Um, and all programming languages have the same power. Uh, that is the set of solvable problems is the same. Um, so algorithms are, are the common abstract language of computer science. Right? So when we talk about computer science, it's designing algorithms is a very, very important part of it. <laughs> um, and certain approaches have been found to, so found to solve certain types of problems. Uh, so they don't always work, but on certain types of problems, they work actually very well. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some strategies that you might use uh, when you're trying to come up with an algorithm in order to solve some problem. So we're going to talk about uh, greedy algorithms. We're going to talk about uh, divide and count conquer. And we're going to talk about uh, hill climbing algorithms. So of these... Uh, sorry, did I lose my notes? Uh, yeah, anyway, of these, uh, uh, the divide and conquer is probably gonna take up the most time. So we're gonna look at, we're gonna go back to sorting and uh, we've seen bubble sort and selection sort. We're gonna now look at something, uh, divide and conquer sort, and we're gonna see how much better it performs than, than the things that we've learned so far. So we'll start with greedy algorithms. So greedy algorithms always choose their next step based on what looks best from the current state, right? So 
I have some partial solution. Um, and then I look at the things that I can add to my solution, either A, B, or C, and I take the one that looks best. Now, in the long run, maybe it's not the best choice to make. For instance, if I'm trying to find a short path in a graph, um, you know, if I, I, take the, I take the step that gets me closest to the destination, but unbeknownst to me, I'm taking a step closer to some obstacle or maze or something that's going to actually take me further from the destination. So, but it looks the best from where I'm standing. So uh, that's, that's the sort of the definition of, of greedy algorithms. Um, so we'll consider this very, very simple problem. So we want to provide coins that's total a specified amount using only 25 cents, 10 cents, and one cent coins. So yeah, there we go. And so what's, a, what's, a, what's an algorithm that we would use to solve this problem? So the specified amount, uh, let's say, for example, 27 cents. So we start with an empty pile of coins and we have a bunch of quarters and dimes and pennies to choose from. Um, so what we do is we, we take our, we choose a coin with the highest value and then we compare it to our, our target. Uh, so we compare our current total to our target. So if adding that coin would not cause the pile to exceed the desired total, then we add it. Um, otherwise we choose the coin with the next highest value instead and repeat. So this would be an example of uh, a greedy algorithm for for finding how I can get 25, 27 cents, for instance, out of a set of uh, dimes, quarters, and pennies. So I start with zero cents, um, and then I take the highest number. So the highest number is 25, and zero plus 25 is not greater than my target. Um, so then I can keep that 25 cents. And now I look at, I grab another 25 cent coin. So 25 cents plus 25 cents is 50 cents. And that's higher than my target. So I've overshot. So I don't want to take this coin. And then I go to the next highest coin. I look at the 10 cents, the dimes. I add that to my total. Um, now I have 35 cents, which is greater than 25 cents. So I don't want to take a dime. So then finally I go to the penny and I take that. And now I'm 25 cents plus one is 26 cents. And that's not greater than 27 cents. Uh, so I can take this. So now I end up with 26 cents. And then I continue to, to repeat the process. And you can refine it down. Now I can repeat, I can go back to the 25 cent coin and add it again, or I can refine it down and, and simply start at the one cent again. That would be more efficient, but in a sense, the, the definition of greedy algorithm is, is still the same. We take whatever looks best, we try it out. Um, if it's not a feasible solution, then we, we go to the next best thing, et cetera. All right, so greedy algorithm, we have a selection procedure. We select what looks best, closest, et cetera. So depending on what we're trying to optimize or what we're trying to accomplish, um, best or closest or whatever sort of heuristic, uh, we're going to choose a heuristic that's appropriate. Um, we do a feasibility test. Is the proposed solution still valid? Um, if it is, uh, then we do a solution check. Is it a solution? So, and if it's not valid, then we go to, of course, the, uh, if it's not valid, we return back to one and look for the next closest thing. All right, so the greedy algorithm chooses the first thing it can consider that does not invalidate the solution. And it stops uh, as soon as it can. So how would the greedy algorithm work if the desired total was 30 cents? Uh, we could do that. I think you guys, I mean, we would first grab 25 cents, which is less than 27. That's fine. And then we would try and grab 25, another 25 cents. And this is false. And then I think you could see that we would then try 10 cents. And this would also be false. 
And so then we would grab uh, one cent, one cent. You know, if we properly defined our algorithm, then we could just um, continue here. Oh, sorry, this shouldn't be 27, this should be 30. Um, and then we get uh, less than 30, but we have uh, actually 30 cents in our pile. So we have uh, 25 plus one cent plus one cent. So we have uh, five of them. And then, so that's equal to 30 and then we found our solution. All right. Any questions on the greedy approach? That should be pretty clear. Uh, sometimes greedy is not the ideal approach because it only considers what it can achieve in terms of progress and not what will happen in the future. Uh, but they remain useful because they can often be used to find a viable solution. So sometimes greedy algorithms may not find your perfect solution, but they find a pretty good one. So they're, uh, they can be quite useful. And if you're trying to design a, an algorithm to solve some problem, you would often start with the greedy and say, well, okay, what, what can happen if we try the greedy algorithm? Uh, and what's the worst that can happen? What's the best that can happen? And what do we expect to happen? Um, yeah, how would you approach the graph co coloring problem with a greedy algorithm and why is a greedy approach worth considering? So let's say graph coloring, we recall is, if I have some graph, I want to color these and uh, my colors, my set of colors, I'm going to use uh, just integers or the whole numbers actually. Um, so I want to color all these and let's say my graph looks like this. So then what's a greedy strategy for this? Well, I would start at some vertex. I don't really have an ordering for these vertices, but maybe they're numbered. Um, but let's say I would start at the bottom, whatever, and then work my way right, left, right, left, right, left. All right, so I start here, I color this guy one. I look, is that feasible? Yes, it is because nobody else has colored yet. So you guys remember with the, the coloring problem? So uh, a valid coloring means that no two neighbors have the same color. Okay, so let's start here. Uh, what's the chromatic number of this graph, by the way? Does anybody know? Chromatic number is, of course, the uh, smallest, val smallest valid coloring, or least valid coloring with the least number of, uh, of colors. Too, yeah, because this is a, it's a bipartite graph, right? So with least number of colors. Um, so now if I, I've started here, I've colored this guy. Now if I go maybe take this guy next, then I can choose one again since, uh, these two, these two vertices are not neighbors, so I can color them both the same color and still have a valid color. C2 is vacuously, could it be two? Because C2 is vacuously true as a subset. So as a, as a lower bound, um, so when you find subgraphs, that's to find a lower bound on the, on the coloring. So that means I can't do it with fewer than uh, two colors, which 
yeah, if I have more than one vertex, uh, then I need more than one color in a connected graph. Um, because, um, because yeah, C2 or uh, K2 requires uh, at least two colors. Um, so I think you're you're thinking of, of the lower bounds, and yes, that's we would have to show that as a lower bound as well in order to show that that's the chromatic number. Um, and it's not it's not right to it's not correct to say it's vacuously true, but it's you know pretty trivially true. If you if you have more than one vertex in a connected graph, you need at least two colors. So it's um, you're sort of on the right track there, but it's it's not exactly correct to say vacuous. But you're right; it's a uh, you you would trivially trivially establish this lower bound that way. So uh, yeah, you're 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 right that we should have we should have established that we had a lower bound as well. Um, so the next step in my greedy algorithm, I take uh, let's say I go to this one, I can color that guy one as well. Um, because he's not neighboring any other colors, so I can color him whatever color I want. And then if I moved to uh, this vertex, then I need a new color because um, I'm neighbors with two vertices with the color with the color one, so I'm going to color him two. And then the same with this guy, and the same with this guy. So in this sense, uh, greedy coloring uh, worked here. Um, would greedy coloring always work on this graph? Would it always find? So in this sense, the greedy coloring actually did find the chromatic number. But does it always? Or is there an order where I would not find the chromatic number on this graph? Yes. So the answer is I can find it. So if I, if I, let's say I did a different order. So I, I start with this guy the same. Uh, I color him one, but now I move to uh, this guy over here to the right instead of up. And I see uh, he's not next to anybody that's colored one. So I can also color him one or her one. Um, and then I go to the next level. Well, if I look at this vertex, now that vertex is next to uh, a vertex, vertex that's colored one. So I have to color it two. I take the next available color. And then I go to the right again. So I go to visit this vertex and I see that, well, this vertex is neighbors with this vertex, which is colored one. So now I have to color this vertex uh, a different color. So I take the first available color, which is also two. So these guys are colored two. And then I go to the next row. If I look at this vertex, now I have a neighbor that's colored one and colored two. So I have to take the next available color, which is uh, three. And then I go to uh, the vertex on the other side here, the last available vertex. I have a neighbor that is colored one. I have a neighbor that is colored two. So I take the next available color that's three. Um, A greedy algorithm, yes. The greedy algorithm will find an upper bound, but not necessarily the minimum. However, uh, so in this case, and if I kept adding vertices on this, then even though this is a bipartite graph, I could end up with n over two colors, which is not a good color. Um, so greedy doesn't always work. Uh, however, this is a very specifically drawn graph, so greedy often works. And also, there is always an order that you can choose the vertices in such that the greedy coloring gives you the optimal coloring, gives you the chromatic number. And there's also uh, an order that you can color them in that finds the worst coloring. So uh, gre greedy coloring is used. It, it's in expectation, it's it's actually pretty good. It might find you something that's double the, on average, depending on what kind of graphs you're dealing with. Although if you're dealing with these bipartite graphs, then you have to, of course, be careful. 
right? So really coloring the, yeah, it's a good starting place. It's not, uh, it's not the best uh, coloring algorithm. All right. Good. Uh, any questions? 3D algorithms. All right. So next we'll go to divide and conquer. <clears throat> Uh, so divide and conquer can be divided into three parts. So we divide the problem into subproblems. So and, and we'll see an example of this shortly. Uh, conquer uh, the subproblem is is called recursively until it's it's solved. So we just further divide, further divide until we uh, until our problems become small enough that we can solve them. And then we combine our solutions uh, into uh, a final uh, final solution. Um, so that's sort of the overview of divide and conquer. So we're going to the example we're going to look at is a merge sort because it it ties in with the sorting algorithms that we saw uh, earlier in the semester. So the principle behind the merge sort algorithm is the divide and conquer problem solving heuristic. So it's based on the idea that it's easy to easier to sort smaller lists than larger ones. And it also uses the idea that combining two sorted lists is relatively easy. Um, so we'll see examples of all of these things. So if I had to sort a list of length four, um, so I needed to come up with an algorithm that would sort this list. Um, it's not exactly clear. I could use selection sort or bubble sort. And because you know it's small, those will perform pretty well. Um, if I want to sort a list of length two, um, I can think of a very easy way to do it, right? I can do one check to see if they're in order, and if they're not, then I can just swap them. Um, if I want to sort a list of length one, uh, what do I have to do? Well, nothing, right? This is sorted. So if I use divide and conquer, if I divide down to lists of length one, then uh, those subproblems are finished. Uh, they're already sorted. So which of these can we think of a fast algorithm for? Well, uh, this one is the fastest, and this one is fast, and this one is probably kind of slow uh, and inefficient. Right. And as the lists get bigger, it's less certain how we would we would sort them, right? We need some kind of, at that point now, we need an officially need an algorithm instead of just some, some quick and dirty solution, like, hey, it's already sorted, or hey, I can just swap them. All right. Um, so let's, and so now we don't know how to sort these longer lists, but maybe we know how to merge two sorted lists, right? I mean, that's, that's not too difficult. Um, so what's, so what can we do to, to merge these two lists? So these are two sorted lists, three, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, five. Um, and I have two pointers here and here. And I just compare the first item from each list and the smallest goes into the first position of the new list, right? Since these are already sorted, I know the smallest item of both of these lists will be the first item that goes here. So in this case, that's the one. And then I have this pointer that I move down to the next item in this sorted list. So again, I'm just going to compare the three to the two. I see that the two is smaller, so I'm going to uh, copy the two down into my new uh, merged sorted list. Now I compare the three and the three. Um, they're the same, so I can put either of them down here. Now I compare the seven and the three. I'm gonna copy the three down. Now I'm comparing seven and five. So five gets copied down. And at this point, this is empty and I can just copy the, the rest of this list um, since those are already in sorted order. All right. So we know how to sort lists of length one and we know how to merge sorted lists. So uh, first of all, any questions on anything on the merge or, or anything up to now? Okay, 
So we know how to sort lists of length one and we know how to merge sorted lists. So here's our procedure for sorting a list. Um, we're gonna divide the unsorted list into two smaller lists, roughly half, half the items each. And then we're gonna sort these sublists and merge them into a single sorted list. So that's a sort of a broad overview of what we're going to do. Um, however, in order to sort these sublists, we need some sort of uh, sorting algorithm. Well, we can just use our original sorting algorithm, right? So we can just make another call to the same procedure. So this is a recursive uh, sorting algorithm. Uh, and so we use our recursion as well as our knowledge of how to sort a list of length one. So once, so this sort of the sub list ends when I hit a, a list of length one, I don't have to make any more recursive calls. I can just return uh, this sort of list. Okay, so here's an example. Here's an unsorted list and we're going to uh, step through the steps. So we're gonna divide it into two lists of roughly equal length split them up, copy them into our new calls to sort. Now we're going to split up this list because uh, we only know how to sort lists of length one or possibly two, but for the purposes of our algorithm, we're saying we only know how to sort a list of length one. So we don't know how to sort it yet, so we're gonna split it again and make an, two more recursive calls. And we're gonna do the same thing for the, uh, for the other half of the original list. Um, all right, so now we take this, uh, we make two more recursive calls because we don't know how to sort a list of length two, even though technically we do. And we're gonna do the same thing for all of these guys. So now at this point we have, these are all sorted lists. So from here on, we're only dealing with sorted lists. Now these are, now we're going to merge them. So. Uh, we have seven, which is a sorted list. We have three, which is a sorted list. And we know how to merge them. We saw the algorithm earlier. So now we have this uh, smaller sorted list. Eight and nine, we can also merge. Five and two, three and one. And now we're going to merge these two sorted lists because that is something we know how to do. So we end up with this three, seven, eight, nine. And we're going to merge these two sorted lists as well. One, two, three, five, and then finally, we're going to merge these two sorted lists and our entire list is sorted, all right? So we didn't, at no point did we know how to do anything other than uh, sort a list of length one and merge two sorted lists, but uh, we've used this divide and conquer method to, to design this algorithm that sorts this list um, completely, all right. Any questions on this diagram or the procedure? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so here's the merge algorithm uh, in pseudocode. So a call to merge with lists called left and right um, and the indices. So J is here at, at zero of left and K is here at zero of right. Uh, then we just do a for loop. Uh, so we know that we're gonna have to look at each item in both of these lists. So we can just do it from zero to the length of the left plus the length of the right. And uh, then we compare the current index of the left to the current index of the right. And if it's smaller, we put it in our new list. Um, otherwise, the right is smaller and we put it in this new list and we, um, if we move the, the item from the left list, then we increment the left pointer. If we move the item from the right list, then we increment the right pointer. <clears throat> and then at the end, we return our, our merged sorted list. Okay. Questions? Okay, <clears throat> so then our sort, uh, if we have an unsorted list of length one, we simply return. So this is our, this should be merge sort. Um, so we're gonna take this list, if the, less, if the length of the list is less than or equal to one, it might be zero, we return the item. 
Um, otherwise, we sort the left side of the list here and put it in this variable. We sort the right side of the list here and put it in this variable, and then we merge them. So that's our uh, merge sort algorithm using the divide and conquer uh, approach. And this is, again, we might be beating a dead horse here, but this is another example where you can sort of see how the, um, uh, this is the same sort algorithm that we just saw, but we're going to see the calls. So here's a call to sort. And then I make these two recursive calls to sort. Uh, and I merge those two sorted lists once they return. So then this pink guy is broken down into two more sorted lists that I again merge. Um, so you can see sort of how the uh, calls are nested. If you want, you can step through this and trace out all the function calls and see how they are uh, how they are nested. I did not find this as illuminating as as simply the other diagram shows you, but um, this does show you how uh, I guess the recursive structure of it. Um, all right. So how good is this divide and conquer? Uh, so we've seen sorting algorithms before in this class. So let's let's analyze this, and we typically analyze using uh, by counting uh, memory accesses or collection accesses. All right, and that is uh, we're going to count sort of where the brackets are. But in a sense, we're going to we're not going to be as uh, I guess we're not going to count as carefully as we normally do. We're, we're basically going to be looking at, uh, we're going to assume that we've done the most efficient thing. And if we access an item, then we, and we need to see it again, then we've stored it. Um, so we're not going to count precisely. We're going to count within a constant amount, right? Which is when we're analyzing an algorithm, that's okay because we throw away the constants anyway. All right, so how many accesses to split an array of length n in two? Uh, well, we just simply uh, run through the array and we copy every item to some other list. Okay, so each of those, uh, every each of the n items we access uh, once, so n times. <clears throat> Although the copy could technically be two memory accesses, right? So I need to grab it from here and put it over there. Um, but we'll assume it's one. <clears throat> How many accesses to merge two arrays of length n over two? Uh, well, again, uh, the same thing as when we split it, we have to look at every, well, we have to compare the two items and then we have to copy one of them over. So in a sense, depending on how you count these memory accesses, uh, we're, we're mainly going to be concerned with the copy. We're going to assume that, um, we can somehow uh, copy it into memory and then uh, when we compare them and then it's, we're going to assume that we can do it efficiently, basically. So again, we're going to say the two merged length arrays are, uh, to merge two uh, arrays of length n over two, so we have n over two plus n over two gives us n. <clears throat> and again, this is really an approximation. So this is, n over two here, n over two. Um, so at each level of the recursion tree, I have to do uh, n uh, accesses. And the same thing here, uh, when I'm copying out uh, this level, n over four, n over four, n over four. But it again all sums to n accesses. And then when I'm merging them, it's actually still the same number. It's uh, this is n over four, and each is copied once, so it's n accesses. So we're going to round off our our analysis to two, um, two n. So at every level of our recursion, so uh, when I split them up here, I do n 
axis is, and when I merge them here, I do another n. So this is how I get this 2n number. All right. And so now we can uh, use our uh, our recursive uh, our recursive formula um, in order to analyze it. So this is the same thing we did for a binary search, but now we're doing it uh, uh, for merge sort. So uh, if T of n is the number of axes to sort an array of length n, so we don't know how many that is, but we know that we're gonna make two recursive calls of approximately n over two. And then we're going to do uh, two of n, two times n memory axes uh, at each call to sort, right? So questions, you guys remember this stuff, are you following? Um, so I can simplify this to, uh, two times t of n over two plus uh, 2n, right? So I just add this and this together. So now I have this value for t of n, but um, what I really want is some closed form because I still have my n's here and I wanna, or uh, my n here and I wanna, I wanna see how deep this recursion goes. So I note that t of n over two, I can define as t of n over four plus t of n over four plus two times n over two, which simplifies to this. And I could substitute that into here, All right? So this gets substituted in for this. Um, and then I can multiply that out. Um, so I get, uh, sorry. So I add these two terms together. So I get two times T of N over four and uh, two times N over two. And uh, the two, so these twos cancel out, but then this two, um, I multiply by this N. So I get this other two times N and, uh, and the beginning of my recurrence looks like this. Um, so I keep following that pattern. Um, and I notice that there is a pattern, and the pattern is after k steps, I have two to the power k uh, times t of n over two to the power k plus two n times k. So that's sort of my, my closed form, but now I'm left with this k that I wanna get rid of. All right, so k, we want a k such that uh, we want to see how deep the recursion goes. So we want our k value such that this is equal to t of one. And this happens when n is equal to 2k. So I get 2k over 2k. Um, so if I solve for k, what does that give me? Does anybody remember? Yeah, so log base two of n, right? So I take the log of both sides um, and I get uh, log base two of n because two to the log base two of n is just equal to n. So log and uh, exponents are the inverse uh, function of each other. All right, so I can now solve my closed form. Um, this gets solved to t of one, like we talked about, and this k here becomes uh, log base two of n. So I get uh, n times t of one, oop. I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> right, give me one second. <clears throat> All right, I hit some, something funny there. <clears throat> um, but we'll notice that uh, t of one is actually zero, right? So when we get to, so this is t of one here. When we get to t of one, we execute this line. So the length of our item is less than or equal to one, so we just return the item. And we never actually have to 
check any memory, we just have to check the length of the list that was passed to us. Uh, so n times zero becomes zero, and we're left with this 2n of log <coughs> base two of n. n log n, right? So if re you recall from earlier in the semester, uh, we had selection sort, which n squared plus 2n minus three, n bubble sort, which was three times n squared minus uh, 3n. So how do these compare? Well, we know that, you know, for big O notation, we ignore the lesser order terms and we ignore the constants. So these sort of break down into O squared, O squared, and O of log N or N log N. Okay, so if we graph these, um, well, we've seen these two before, we've seen bubble sort and selection sort. So we've seen that selection sort performs better than bubble sort, but merge sort uh, next to these two almost appears flat, right? Because uh, n log n is significantly faster than n squared. So this, this divide and conquer algorithm on our sorting um, actually works very, very well. All right, any questions on merge sort? Okay, so you don't have to, you should know sort of the ideas behind it. Um, you don't necessarily know how, have to know how to analyze it at this point, although uh, that day is coming, so uh, it doesn't hurt if you know it. Um, but you should be, this should be an, an introduction to the divide and conquer algorithm and how well it actually does work, um, especially in comparison to, to things like bubble sort and selection sort, which are straightforward ways to, of sorting, but they're, you know, they lack sort of that clever touch. Um, so another divide and conquer sorting algorithm is quick sort. And quick sort is if you run a sort in, uh, I think C uses quick sort. Um, and it works really well. So it's quick sort in practice works uh, fast. And we're just gonna go over it in vague details. So if I have an unsorted list, I choose a pivot. Now I can choose a pivot at random or I can choose the first, the first location. Basically you want something that is gonna be roughly, uh, in terms of value, roughly in the middle of your, of your list. And then I'm just going to take each item. So I'm gonna compare the six to the five. Uh, the six is greater than five, so it goes in this list. And then I compare the four to the five. The four is less than the five, so it goes up here. And then next is eight. Oops. So eight goes here because it's greater than five. Zero and two are less than five, so they go up here, et cetera. So I pick a pivot at random. I compare all the items to it, and I just uh, push those items into separate lists. All right. And so now I have this new, not really sorted list, but uh, all the things that are less than five are on this side, and all the things that are greater than five are on this side. And we can assume that we can sort those two sides recursively, which we do by calling quicksort on them again. And so <clears throat> at the end of that entire operation, uh, we end up with this completely sorted list. Uh, yeah, the algorithm seems quite complex. Um, it performs well. Uh, and if you use a programming language that has list comprehensions, um, it's actually very easy to write. So list comprehensions, you might recognize, uh, well, you probably won't recognize the, the notation, but I'll, I'll sort of show you how it is very similar to the set builder notation that, that we use in math. Right, so if we look at Python, Python has this list comprehension. So I can take x for x in, and then just take this list, and uh, I use a predicate to take everything out of this list that is less than or equal to my pivot, right? So this is sort of the, uh, if I look at this, this resembles, even though it's a list, resembles a set builder notation, right? So I have some sort of 
I take every item uh, that's in my list and then I apply this predicate to it and I build a new list. And then I take my pivot and then I take the other side, uh, all the items that are based on this predicate. So if X is greater than my pivot, then they all go into the other list. So this is the entire, in Python, that's the entire quicksort algorithm uh, written using list comprehensions. And list comprehensions are very, very similar to the set notation that we use. And Haskell is, is something similar. It also uses uh, list comprehensions. I did use a little bit of Haskell. It's, uh, uh, but I don't remember all of this, except, you know, I can see from, it takes the items from A to, oh, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why the minus is there, but this is the predicate. Um, yeah, yeah. It's been a while since I've done Haskell, so I don't recognize that. But uh, it, it, it's similar that the list builder notation is the is again similar to the set builder notation, except it's a list, which means things do have implicitly an order. Have we seen seen divide and conquer before in this in this class? I did mention it earlier, but uh, what what other algorithms did we see that were divide and conquer? So I did mention uh, binary search, right? So we did look at that uh, when we first did uh, recurrences. Um, so we analyzed binary search and we saw that it was very fast to find something if you have a sorted list. Um, and there's also binary searches. When you're searching on a list, you're, you're sort of searching in one dimension, but there are you know, two dimensional and three dimensional versions of these algorithms. So point location algorithms, uh, that are versions of binary search where you divide up the plane into uh, you know half and then half again and then half again until you find your point. <clears throat> and induction is is sort of a, an example of divide and conquer, although it might be more aptly described as reduce and conquer because uh, sometimes we only reduce by one, but we can also uh, divide. You know, if we use strong induction, uh, that can be an example of divide and conquer. Um, all right, so that's divide and conquer algorithms. Um, any questions? All right, so we'll look at our final uh, our final uh, algorithm strategy, and then we'll decide if we uh, if I do any of these proofs. Um, all right, so the last. One that we're going to look at today, and it's certainly not the last uh, approach, but it's this is an introduction. So, uh, hill climbing algorithms. <clears throat> so, without calculus, at what value? Uh, what value of x is the minimum for this function? Um, so, how can we how can we figure this out? Uh, well, we can start supplying numbers, right? So if we take x equal to zero, then y is equal to uh, zero minus zero plus 22 equals 22. So, um, so we have one number, so let's take now x equal to one, um, and we get two x squared equals two minus 12 plus 22, um, and that is equal to 12. And then I can take x equal to, so this is lower, uh, x equal to two, and now y is equal to uh, eight minus 24 plus 22, uh, which is six. Um, x equal to three, I get y equal to 16 minus 36, plus 22, uh, what is that, it's 38, so that's two. Yeah, and then x equal to four, uh, y is equal to 32, minus 48 plus 22, 
what is that, 54, so that's six again. So what is the, so what do we think is the minimum? And maybe if we did x equal five, y is equal to uh, 50 minus 60 plus 22 uh, is 12. Yeah, at x equal to three, we find the minimum. And we can just do that by, by testing consecutive values. Um, and here, this is rather simple. You could, you know, you could plot this out or you can use calculus, uh, but there are more complex functions where that's not, uh, you know, exactly feasible. Rewrite in vertex form. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, so I'm not sure what, uh, off the top of my head, what vertex form is. Um, all right. Well, uh yeah probably you could do that um so it's been a while since i've taken that stuff so you would have to refresh me on how um but yeah sure you can do that um this is a this is a simple function um so there's multiple ways to solve it um what we're talking about here is is very a simple way maybe it's maybe we have a function that's so this I can I can take a look at it and maybe I can graph it. There's a there's a hundred things I can do, but if I have a function y equals uh, calc, you know, int x, uh, that's some line in my program, and I want to find the minimum. Um, I don't even know how this is calculated. So uh, one way to do it is to is to test the values. Um, so yeah, that's called hill climbing because basically I climb down the hill over here. And then uh, once I start climbing up again, I know I found uh, the minimum. Or have I? Is there, can you think of anything where, uh, for, <laughs> yeah. Um, can you think of anything where this would, this algorithm would fail? Or maybe not, Fail, but what's maybe, uh, does it always work? Anything that doesn't have a middle. Yeah, in a sense, I, I think what you're getting at is correct. So this is the, the plotting. So if we plot every value, uh, then we find down here, we get uh, at x equal to, would we say three? Uh, we get the minimum. Um, but let's say we have this function here where this is, this is a funny looking pi, but this should be pi. Um, so if you're familiar with, uh, so this is in radians, not degrees. So this is uh, the cos function, cosine function. And so if I have uh, y equals cos of three pi times x over x. And so uh, three pi is simply uh, in degrees, it's three times 180 degrees. Um, but this is in radians, so. So would a hill climber succeed or fail? Uh, well, the thing about the cos function is it does something like this. And it goes forever. Um, so this little function here, if we plot it out, um, and if we tried to use the strategy as before, we would say, oh, this is the minimum, which is not true because this is the minimum. So if we, um, you know, we just supplied values, discrete values until the, the function started to turn around, then we would uh, mistakenly identify this as the min. Right? So hill climbing doesn't always work. Um, there is a way to overcome that though. Uh, so what we're going to do, uh, there's something called simulated annealing in which uh, uh, we take random jumps uh, with a certain probability uh, to different places uh, and test them. So if we're, if we're doing a hill climbing here and then we start here and then maybe we just randomly jump to over here and then maybe we start climbing 
and then randomly jump here, and then we see, ah, oh, we're making good progress. And then we find this point, but then we jump around a few more times just to make sure that we got all the right points. Um, so you could see something like this. Um, this is called simulated annealing. So annealing is a, this is a process when you're uh, cooling metal is that you cool it slowly so that uh, the, the structure is more even. Um, but you can use it here in that, so as time goes on, we sort of keep track of the temperature. Um, and as the temperature gets lower, you jump with uh, a smaller and smaller probability um, until you find the exact, uh, in this case, this is the highest point in this function. And technically, simulated annealing always works if you're willing to spend enough time. Um, or you can cut your time short and, and just take something, uh, uh, take your chances with whatever value you got sometime before that. All right. So that's uh, yeah, introduction to algorithms. All right. So I have technically there's 45 minutes left. Um, any questions on any of this? All right. Um, so this is all of the uh, material for the course. Uh, it ends here. I'm going to, uh, for the next little while, I'm going to actually introduce you to um, a couple of proofs just to sort of um, because when you move to 2804 and 3804, you're going to be doing proofs a little bit differently than we did them here. So I just want to show you a couple. Uh, it's completely optional. Um, you are going to see them, uh, these types of proofs in 2804 and 3804 um, if you stay in the honors program. But uh, at this point, the, the, the course material is done. Um, so Friday, we have one more class. And uh, at the same time, 535, and it's going to be review. Um, and uh, I'll release the, uh, the practice exam before that. So, um, you guys can, uh, have some questions to ask, but, uh, yeah. Um, and so for any of you bailing now, I just want to say thank you for, for showing up, uh, week after week. I know it's a, it's a small group now, which is sort of expected, especially when you can just simply watch the video after. Um, but it's always nice to have your guys feedback, uh, it's been really great. You ask very interesting questions and you, you know, you point me at things that uh, I didn't realize I wasn't uh, illuminating. So, so it's been very great. Uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, the other thing is um, you should have gotten a, an email about uh, evaluation, student evaluations. So I encourage you to fill those out. Those are online. Um, I tried to find my email before this class, but I couldn't. So I got an email saying what the closing date is. I think the closing date is actually very, very soon. So if you want to do that, you have to do that soon, sooner rather than later. Um, I would have mentioned it last week, but we didn't have a class. I should have sent out an email, but I forgot. Um, <clears throat> all right. Good. Uh, so here is the proofs of, so I'm going to skip the proof of Euler's formula because it's not as interesting. Um, but I'm going to do uh, six color six colorability of planar graphs and five colorability. So what does that mean? Um, so this of course means that the <clears throat> I can color any planar graph in six colors. And I'm going to prove that that's true. Um, and this proof uses uh, Euler's formula. So let's. Uh, so Euler's formula, if you recall, is. Well, the actual Euler's formula, and then there's the, the derivation that we're going to use. Um, so the actual Euler's formula is uh, V plus F minus E equals two. So V equals vertices in my planar graph. Uh, F is faces, 
number of faces should be number of and uh, E is edges. <clears throat> so assuming that's true, we can derive this other formula. So the number of edges is less than or equal to uh, what is it? 3V minus 6. So that's in a planar graph, which means that I can draw it without crossings. And so based on this, we can uh, six color our graph. So, so we have some planar graph I can draw without any crossing edges. And my claim is that I can always color it with at most six colors. And uh, so we're going to prove it using this formula here. Um, and so one implication of this formula is that, let's see. Uh, so one of our, our first lemma, lemma one, is that every planar graph. You can't see the slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, sorry. Oh, I didn't see the chat window coming up either. Oh, I'm very sorry. All right. <laughs> sorry sorry guys thank you very much um okay so we're going to prove uh six color ability of planar graphs and then we'll if we have time we're going to move on to the five color ability um so euler's formula is uh vertices plus faces minus edges equals two and uh so in these uh in this expression, V is the number of vertices, F is the number of faces, and E is the number of edges. Um, and one of the um, yeah, one of the derivations of Euler's formula is uh, the number of edges is less than three V minus six. So V being the number of vertices. So any planar graph, the number of edges it cannot be greater than uh, or three uh, V minus six. And so we're going to uh, use this to prove that every planar graph has a vertex of degree at most five. Okay. Um, so how we're going to do that is So we're going to do a proof by contradiction. So we're going to assume all vertices have degree six or more. So where do we think uh, where do we think our contradiction is going to come from? Assuming that I'm going to use this formula here. Can anybody see how we, how this uh, how this might progress? So what's the connection then between degree? Uh, so we have some connection between degree and the number of edges, right? So what is that? Do we remember what that is? <laughs> Let's use your imagination, folks. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I feel bad about that. Um, so all vertices have degree six or more. So, um, so the handshaking theorem So if we take the sum of the degree of all the vertices in our graph, that's equal to twice the number of edges, right? Um, so if we assume all vertices have a degree of six or more, uh, then this, uh, 
Yeah, this must be at least at least 6V. Um, and now using the handshaking theorem, that means that's at least 3E, uh, which is greater than uh, 3, sorry, 6E, 3V, which is greater than 3V minus 6. All right, so that's where we reach our contradiction. If there's uh, not a vertex of degree five or less, then uh, we end up with too many edges for a planar graph. So each planar graph must have, uh, must have a vertex of degree at most five. All right, so if we have a vertex of degree at most five, let's say this is V, one, two, three, four, five. So we're gonna use this in our proof now. Um, so proof of theorem. And we're going to use a proof by induction. So proof by induction goes uh, we're going to use proposition P of K uh, and show that that implies P of K plus one. So we're going to assume this is true and show that it implies that this is true. So assume uh, our graph G has K plus one vertices. So lemma one says at least one vertex has degree less than or equal to five. Um, and we'll call that vertex V. So now by induction, what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase V and all of the edges incoming to it. So now there's there's still some graph out here, um, maybe some other vertices, but there's um, so then we have k vertices left. So that means we can six color. Uh, so let's say uh, so G prime is G with V removed. And uh, so G prime has K vertices. So we can six color G prime because we've assumed that by induction, that was our inductive hypothesis. So we've assumed PK is true. All right, so we can six color this. So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three. So now if we put V back in, we know V has at most uh, five neighbors. So incident to at most five different colors. All right, so we can color V with the sixth color, uh, whichever one's missing from here. So one, two, we have four, six. Uh, so we can color it five. And that is a valid coloring because it's V is not neighbors with anybody who's the same color as V. Um, and we've used at most six colors.
Okay. Any questions on that? All right. Um, <clears throat> so I think the five coloring theorem uh, is a little bit long to do right now. Um, but maybe I'll do it uh, uh, next week. If, uh, if the review class is short enough, then uh, I'll, I'll throw that in. But, uh, but it, it uses basically the same technique, except that now I can sort of um, recolor parts of the graph. Um, I know that I have almost five neighbors, but I can show that I can color two of those neighbors the same color. Um, but this is sort of how you would explain something in 2804 or 3804. Um, you should do it more neatly, of course. And, uh, but, um, you know, once you're past, uh, 1805, uh, it's all very structured the way you prove things, but, uh, we get a lot less formal as you go on. You can explain things in English as long as your thoughts are still well organized and so on and so forth. Um, okay. So uh, that's it for tonight. Um, sorry for the screen thing. Um, I'll stick around for 10 minutes to answer questions. Uh, other than that, I will see you guys on Friday.